Such were his doings in the matter of Adrastus. With respect to the Dorian tribes, not choosing the Sicyonians to have the same tribes as the Argives, he changed all the old names for new ones. And here he took special occasion to mock the Sicyonians, for he drew his new names from the words pig and ass, adding thereto the usual tribe endings. Only in the case of his own tribe he did nothing of the sort, but gave them a name drawn from his own kingly office for he called his own tribe the Archelae, or rulers, while the others he named Hiatai, or pig folk, Oniatai, or ass folk, and Koriatai, or swine folk. The Sicyonians kept these names not only during the reign of Cleisthenes, but even after his death, by the space of sixty years. Then, however, they took counsel together and changed to the well-known names of Helions, Pampilians, and Dimanotai, taking at the same time as a fourth name the title Argeleans from Argeleus, the son of Adrastus. Thus had Cleisthenes the Sicyonian done. The Athenian Cleisthenes, who was grandson by the mother's side of the other and had been named after him, resolved from contempt, as I believe, of the Ionians, that his tribes should not be the same as theirs, and so followed the pattern set him by his namesake of Sicyon. Having brought entirely over to his own side the common people of Athens whom he had before disdained, he gave all the tribes new names and made the number greater than formerly. Instead of the four phylarchs, he established ten. He likewise placed ten deems in each of the tribes, and he was, now that the common people took his part, very much more powerful than his adversaries. Isagoras, in his turn, lost ground, and therefore, to counterplot his enemy, he called in Cleomenes the Lacedaemonian, who had already, at the time when he was besieging the Pisistratidae, made a contract of friendship with him. A charge is even brought against Cleomenes that he was on terms of too great familiarity with Isagoras's wife. At this time, the first thing that he did was to send a herald and require that Cleisthenes and a large number of Athenians besides, whom he called the accursed, should leave Athens. This message he sent at the suggestion of Isagoras, for in the affair referred to, the blood guiltiness lay on the Alcmaeonidae and their partisans, while he and his friends were quite clear of it. The way in which the accursed at Athens got their name was the following. There was a certain Athenian called Chilon, a victor at the Olympic Games, who aspired to the sovereignty, and, aided by a number of his companions who were of the same age with himself, made an attempt to seize the citadel. But the attack failed, and Chilon became a suppliant at the image. Hereupon, the heads of the Nocraries, who at that time bore rule in Athens, induced the fugitives to remove by a promise to spare their lives. Nevertheless, they were all slain, and the blame was laid on the Alcmeonidae. All this happened before the time of Pisistratus. When the message of Cleomenes arrived, requiring Cleisthenes and the accursed to quit the city, Cleisthenes departed of his own accord. Cleomenes, however, notwithstanding his departure, came to Athens with a small band of followers, and on his arrival sent into banishment 700 Athenian families, which were pointed out to him by Isagoras. Succeeding here, he next endeavoured to dissolve the council, and to put the government into the hands of 300 of the partisans of that leader. But the council resisted and refused to obey his orders, whereupon Cleomenes, Isagoras, and their followers took possession of the citadel. Here they were attacked by the rest of the Athenians, who took the side of the council, and were besieged for the space of two days. On the third day they accepted terms, being allowed, at least such of them as were Lacedaemonians, to quit the country. And so the word which came to Cleomenes received its fulfilment. For when he first went up into the citadel, meaning to seize it, just as he was entering the sanctuary of the goddess in order to question her, the priestess arose from her throne before he had passed the doors and said, Stranger from Lacedaemon, depart hence and presume not to enter the holy place. It is not lawful for a Dorian to set foot there. But he answered, O oh, woman, I am not a Dorian but an Achaean. 
Slighting this warning, Cleomenes made his attempt, and so he was forced to retire, together with his Lacedaemonians. The rest were cast into prison by the Athenians and condemned to die, among them Timasitius the Delphian, of whose prowess and courage I have great things which I could tell. So these men died in prison. The Athenians directly afterwards recalled Cleisthenes and the 700 families which Cleomenes had driven out. And further, they sent envoys to Sardis to make an alliance with the Persians, for they knew that war would follow with Cleomenes and the Lacedaemonians. When the ambassadors reached Sardis and delivered their message, Artaphernes, son of Histaspes, who was at that time governor of the place, inquired of them who they were and in what part of the world they dwelt, that they wanted to become allies of the Persians. The messengers told him, upon which he answered them shortly, that if the Athenians chose to give earth and water to King Darius, he would conclude an alliance with them. But if not, they might go home again. After consulting together, the envoys anxious to form the alliance accepted the terms, but on their way to Athens they fell into deep disgrace on account of their compliance. Meanwhile, Cleomenes, who considered himself to have been insulted by the Athenians, both in word and deed, was drawing a force together from all parts of the Peloponnese, without informing anyone of his object, which was to revenge himself on the Athenians, and to establish Isagoras, who had escaped with him from the citadel, as despot of Athens. Accordingly, with a large army, he invaded the district of Eleusis, while the Boeotians, who had concerted measures with him, took Oinoe and Hisiae, two country towns upon the frontier, and at the same time the Chalcidians, on another side, plundered diverse places in Attica. The Athenians, notwithstanding that danger, threatened them from every quarter, put off all thought of the Boeotians and the Chalcidians till the future time, and marched against the Peloponnesians, who were at Eleusis. As the two hosts were about to engage, first of all the Corinthians, bethinking themselves that they were perpetrating a wrong, changed their minds and drew off from the main army. Then Demaratus, son of Aristone, who was himself king of Sparta and joint leader of the expedition, and who till now had had no sort of quarrel with Cleomenes, followed their example. On account of this rupture between the kings, a law was passed at Sparta, forbidding both monarchs to go out together with the army, as had been the custom hitherto. The law also provided that as one of the kings was to be left behind, one of the Tindaridae should also remain at home, whereas hitherto both had accompanied the expeditions as auxiliaries. So when the rest of the allies saw that the Lacedaemonian kings were not of one mind, and that the Corinthian troops had quitted their post, they likewise drew off and departed. This was the fourth time that the Dorians had invaded Attica. Twice they came as enemies, and twice they came to do good service to the Athenian people. Their first invasion took place at the period when they founded Megara, and is rightly placed in the reign of Codros at Athens. The second and third occasions were when they came from Sparta to drive out the Pisistatidae. The fourth was the present attack, when Cleomenes, at the head of a Peloponnesian army, entered at Eleusis. Thus the Dorians had now four times invaded Attica. So when the Spartan army had broken up from its quarters thus ingloriously, the Athenians, wishing to revenge themselves, marched first against the Chalcidians. The Boeotians, however, advancing to the aid of the latter as far as the Euryphus, the Athenians thought it best to attack them first. A battle was fought accordingly, and the Athenians gained a very complete victory, killing a vast number of the enemy and taking 700 of them alive. After this, on the very same day, they crossed into Euboea and engaged the Chalcidians with the like success, whereupon they left 4,000 settlers upon the lands of the Hippopotai, which is the name the Chalcidians give to their rich men. All the Chalcidian prisoners whom they took were put in irons and kept for a long time in close confinement, as likewise were the Boeotians, until the ransom asked for them was paid. And this the Athenians fixed at two minutes. The chains wherewith they were fettered the Athenians suspended in their citadel, 
where they were still to be seen in my day, hanging against the wall, scorched by the median flames, opposite the chapel which faces the west. The Athenians made an offering of the tenth part of the ransom money and expended it on the brazen chariot drawn by four steeds which stands on the left hand immediately that one enters the gateway of the citadel. The inscription runs as follows. When Calchas and Boeotia dared her might, Athens subdued their pride in valorous fight, gave bonds for insults, and the ransom paid from the full tenths these steeds for Pallas made. Thus did the Athenians increase in strength, and it's plain enough, not from this instance only, but from many everywhere, that freedom is an excellent thing, since even the Athenians, who while they continued under the rule of tyrants, weren't a whit more valiant than any of their neighbours, no sooner shook off the yoke than they became decidedly the first of all. These things show that while undergoing oppression they let themselves be beaten, since then they worked for a master, but so soon as they got their freedom each man was eager to do the best he could for himself. So fared it now with the Athenians. Meanwhile the Thebans, who longed to be revenged on the Athenians, had sent to the oracle and been told by the Pythoness that of their own strength they would be unable to accomplish their wish. They must lay the matter, she said, before the many voiced, and ask the aid of those nearest to them. The messengers, therefore, on their return, called a meeting, and laid the answer of the oracle before the people, who no sooner heard the advice to ask the aid of those nearest them, than they exclaimed, What, aren't they who dwell the nearest to us, the men of Tanagra, of Coronea, and Thespiae? Yet these men always fight on our side and have aided us with a good heart all through the war. Of what use is it to ask them? But maybe this isn't the true meaning of the oracle. As they were thus discoursing one with another, a certain man informed of the debate cried out, Methinks that I understand what course the oracle would recommend to us. A sopus, they say, had two daughters, Thebe and Egina. The god means that as these two were sisters, we ought to ask the Aeginetans to lend us aid. As no one was able to hit on any better explanation, the Thebans forthwith sent messengers to Aegina, and according to the advice of the oracle, asked their aid as the people nearest to them. In answer to this petition, the Aeginetans said that they would give them the Iacidae for helpers. The Thebans, now relying on the assistance of the Iacidae, ventured to renew the war, but they met with so rough a reception that they resolved to send to the Aeginetans again, returning the Iacidae and beseeching them to send some men instead. The Aeginetans, who were at that time a most flourishing people, elated with their greatness, and at the same time calling to mind their ancient feud with Athens, agreed to lend the Thebans aid and forthwith went to war with the Athenians without even giving them notice by a herald. The attention of these latter being engaged by the struggle with the Boeotians, the Aeginetans in their ships of war made descents upon Attica, plundered Phalerum, and ravaged a vast number of the townships upon the seaboard, whereby the Athenians suffered very grievous damage. The ancient feud between the Aeginetans and Athenians arose out of the following circumstances. Once upon a time the land of Epidorus would bear no crops, and the Epidorians sent to consult the oracle of Delphi concerning their affliction. The answer bade them set up the images of Damia and Auxesia, and promised them better fortune when that should be done. Shall the images be made of bronze or stone? the Epidorians asked. But the Pythoness replied, Of neither, but let them be made of the garden olive. Then the Epidorians sent to Athens and asked leave to cut olive wood in Attica, believing the Athenian olives to be the holiest. And according to others, because there were no olives at that time anywhere else in all the world but at Athens. The Athenians answered that they would give them leave, but on condition of their bringing offerings year by year to Athena Polias and to Erechtheus. 
The Epidorians agreed, and having obtained what they wanted, made the images of olive wood and set them up in their own country. Henceforth their land bore its crops, and they duly paid the Athenians what had been agreed upon. Anciently, and even down to the time when this took place, the Edenetans were in all things subject to the Epidorians, and had to cross over to Epidorus for the trial of all suits in which they were engaged one with another. After this, however, the Edenetans built themselves ships, and growing proud, revolted from the Epidorians. Having thus come to be at enmity with them, the Edenetans, who were masters of the sea, ravaged Epidorus and even carried off these very images of Damia and Auxesia, which they set up in their own country, in the interior, at a place called Oya, about twenty furlongs from their city. And this done, they fixed a worship for the images, which consisted in part of sacrifices, in part of female satiric choruses, while at the same time they appointed certain men to furnish the choruses, ten for each goddess. These choruses didn't abuse men, but only the women of the country. Holy orgies of a similar kind were in use also among the Epidorians, and likewise another sort of holy orgies, whereof it's not lawful to speak. After the robbery of the images, the Epidorians ceased to make the stipulated payments to the Athenians, wherefore the Athenians sent to Epidorus to remonstrate. But the Epidorians proved to them that they weren't guilty of any wrong. While the images continued in their country, they said, they had duly paid the offerings according to the agreement. Now that the images had been taken from them, they were no longer under any obligation to pay. The Athenians should make their demand of the Aegeanetans, in whose possession the figures now were. Upon this the Athenians sent to Aegina and demanded the images back. But the Aegeanetans answered that the Athenians had nothing whatever to do with them. After this the Athenians relate that they sent a trireme to Aegina with certain citizens on board, and that these men who bore commission from the state landed in Aegina and sought to take the images away, considering them to be their own, inasmuch as they were made of their wood. And first they endeavoured to wrench them from their pedestals, and so carry them off. But failing herein, they in the next place tied ropes to them, and set to work to try if they could haul them down. In the midst of their hauling, suddenly there was a thunderclap, and with the thunderclap an earthquake, and the crew of the trireme were forthwith seized with madness, and like enemies began to kill one another, until at last there was but one left, who returned alone to Phalerum. Such is the account given by the Athenians. The Aegeanetans deny that there was only a single vessel. Had there been only one, they say, or no more than a few, they would easily have repulsed the attack, even if they had had no fleet at all. But the Athenians came against them with a large number of ships, wherefore they gave way and didn't hazard a battle. They don't, however, explain clearly whether it was from a conviction of their own inferiority at sea that they yielded, or whether it was for the purpose of doing that which in fact they did. Their account is that the Athenians, disembarking from their ships, when they found that no resistance was offered, made for the statues, and failing to wrench them from their pedestals, tied ropes to them and began to haul. Then, they say, and some people will perhaps believe them, though I, for my part, do not, the two statues, as they were being dragged and hauled, fell down both upon their knees, in which attitude they still remain. Such, according to them, was the conduct of the Athenians. They, meanwhile, having learnt beforehand what was intended, had prevailed on the Argives to hold themselves in readiness. And the Athenians, accordingly, were but just landed on their coasts when the Argives came to their aid. Secretly and silently they crossed over from Epidorus, and before the Athenians were aware, cut off their retreat to their ships and fell upon them. And the thunder came exactly at that moment, and the earthquake with it. The Argives and the Aegeanetans both agree in giving this account, and the Athenians themselves acknowledge that but one of their men returned alive to Attica. According to the Argives, he escaped from the battle in which the rest of the Athenian troops were destroyed by them. 
According to the Athenians, it was the god who destroyed their troops. And even this one man didn't escape, for he perished in the following manner. When he came back to Athens, bringing word of the calamity, the wives of those who had been sent out on the expedition took it sorely to heart that he alone should have survived the slaughter of all the rest. They therefore crowded round the man and struck him with the brooches by which their dresses were fastened, each as she struck, asking him where he had left her husband. And the man died in this way. The Athenians thought the deed of the women more horrible even than the fate of the troops. As, however, they didn't know how else to punish them, they changed their dress and compelled them to wear the costume of the Ionians. Till this time, the Athenian women had worn a Dorian dress, shaped nearly like that which prevails at Corinth. Henceforth, they were made to wear the linen tunic, which doesn't require brooches. In very truth, however, this dress isn't originally Ionian, but Carian, for anciently the Greek women all wore the costume which is now called the Dorian. It said further that the Argives and the Aegeanetans made it a custom on this same account for their women to wear brooches half as large again as formerly, and to offer brooches rather than anything else in the temple of these goddesses. They also forbade the bringing of anything attic into the temple, were it even a jar of earthenware, and made a law that none but native drinking vessels should be used there in time to come. From this early age to my own day, the Argive and Aegean women have always continued to wear their brooches larger than formerly, through hatred of the Athenians. Such then was the origin of the feud which existed between the Aegeanetans and the Athenians. Hence, when the Thebans made their application for succor, the Aegeanetans, calling to mind the matter of images, gladly lent their aid to the Boeotians. They ravaged all the sea coast of Attica, and the Athenians were about to attack them in return when they were stopped by the oracle of Delphi, which bade them wait till thirty years had passed from the time that the Aegeanetans did the wrong, and in the thirty-first year, having first set apart a precinct for Iacus, then to begin the war. So should they succeed to their wish, the oracle said, but if they went to war at once, though they would still conquer the island in the end, yet they must go through much suffering and much exertion before taking it. On receiving this warning, the Athenians set apart a precinct for Iacus, the same which still remains dedicated to him in their marketplace, but they couldn't hear with any patience of waiting thirty years after they had suffered such grievous wrong at the hands of the Aegeanetans. Accordingly, they were making ready to take their revenge when a fresh stir on the part of the Lacedaemonians hindered their projects. These last had become aware of the truth, how that the Alcmeonidae had practiced on the Pythoness, and the Pythoness had schemed against themselves and against the Pisistratidae, and the discovery was a double grief to them. For while they had driven their own sworn friends into exile, they found that they hadn't gained thereby a particle of goodwill from Athens. They were also moved by certain prophecies which declared that many dire calamities should befall them at the hands of the Athenians. Of these, in times past, they had been ignorant, but now they had become acquainted with them by means of Cleomenes, who had brought them with him to Sparta. Having found them in the Athenian citadel, where they had been left by the Pisotratidae when they were driven from Athens, they were in the temple, and Cleomenes, having discovered them, carried them off. So when the Lacedaemonians obtained possession of the prophecies and saw that the Athenians were growing in strength and had no mind to acknowledge any subjection to their control, it occurred to them that if the people of Attica were free, they would be likely to be as powerful as themselves, but if they were oppressed by a tyranny, they would be weak and submissive. Under this feeling they sent and recalled Hippias, the son of Pisistratus, from Sigeum upon the Hellespont, where the Pisistratidae had taken shelter. Hippias came at their bidding, and the Spartans, on his arrival, summoned deputies from all their other allies, and thus addressed the assembly. Friends and brothers in arms, we are free to confess that we did lately a thing which was not right. Misled by counterfeit oracles, 
We drove from their country those who were our sworn and true friends, and who had, moreover, engaged to keep Athens in dependence upon us. And we delivered the government into the hands of an unthankful people, a people who no sooner got their freedom by our means and grew in power than they turned us and our king, with every token of insult, out of their city. Since then they have gone on, continually raising their thoughts higher, as their neighbours of Boeotia and Calchis have already discovered to their cost, and as others too will presently discover if they shall offend them. Having thus erred, we will endeavour now with your help to remedy the evils we have caused, and to obtain vengeance on the Athenians. For this cause we have sent for Hippias to come here, and have summoned you likewise from your several states, that we may all now, with heart and hand, unite to restore him to Athens, and thereby give him back that which we took from him formerly. Such was the address of the Spartans. The greater number of the allies listened without being persuaded. None, however, broke silence, but Sosicles, the Corinthian, who exclaimed, Surely the heaven will soon be below, and the earth above, and men will henceforth live in the sea, and fish take their place upon the dry land, since you, Lacedaemonians, propose to put down free governments in the cities of Greece, and to set up tyrannies in their room. There is nothing in the whole world so unjust. Nothing so bloody as a tyranny. If, however, it seems to you a desirable thing to have the cities under despotic rule, begin by putting a tyrant over yourselves, and then establish despots in the other states. While you continue yourselves, as you have always been, unacquainted with tyranny, and take such excellent care that Sparta may not suffer from it, to act as you are now doing is to treat your allies unworthily. If you knew what tyranny was, as well as ourselves, you would be better advised than you now are in regard to it. The government of Corinth was once an oligarchy, a single race, called Bacchiadae, who intermarried only among themselves, held the management of affairs. Now it happened that Amphion, one of these, had a daughter named Labda, who was lame, and whom therefore none of the Bacchiadae would consent to marry. So she was taken to wife by Aetian, son of Echecrates, a man of the township of Petra, who was, however, by descent of the race of the Lapithae, and of the house of Caneus. Aetian, as he had no child, either by this wife or by any other, went to Delphi to consult the oracle concerning the matter. Scarcely had he entered the temple when the Pythoness saluted him in these words, No one honours thee now, Aetian, worthy of honour. Labda shall soon be a mother, her offspring a rock that will one day fall on the kingly race and right the city of Corinth. By some chance this address of the oracle to Aetian came to the ears of the Bacchiadae, who till then had been unable to perceive the meaning of another earlier prophecy which likewise bore upon Corinth and pointed to the same event as Aetian's prediction. It was the following, When mid the rocks an eagle shall bear a carnivorous lion, mighty and fierce, he shall loose the limbs of many beneath them, Brood ye well upon this, all ye Corinthian people, ye who dwell by fair Pyrene and beetling Corinth. The Bacchiadae had possessed this oracle for some time, but they were quite at a loss to know what it meant until they heard the response given to Aetian. Then, however, they at once perceived its meaning, since the two agreed so well together. Nevertheless, though the bearing of the first prophecy was now clear to them, they remained quiet, being minded to put to death the child which Aetian was expecting. As soon, therefore, as his wife was delivered, they sent ten of their number to the township where Aetian lived, with orders to make away with the baby. So the men came to Petra, and went into Aetian's house, and there asked if they might see the child, and Labda, who knew nothing of their purpose, but thought their inquiries arose from a kindly feeling towards her husband, brought the child, and laid him in the arms of one of them. 
Now they had agreed by the way that whosoever first got hold of the child should dash it against the ground. It happened, however, by a providential chance that the babe, just as Labda put him into the man's arms, smiled in his face. The man saw the smile and was touched with pity so that he couldn't kill it. He therefore passed it on to his neighbor, who gave it to a third, and so it went through all the ten without any one choosing to be the murderer. The mother received her child back, and the men went out of the house and stood near the door, and there blamed and reproached one another, chiefly, however, accusing the man who had first had the child in his arms, because he had not done as had been agreed upon. At last, after much time had been thus spent, they resolved to go into the house again, and all take part in the murder. But it was fated that evil should come upon Corinth from the progeny of Aetian, and so it chanced that Labda, as she stood near the door, heard all that the men said to one another. And fearful of their changing their mind and returning to destroy her baby, she carried him off and hid him in what seemed to her the most unlikely place to be suspected, that's to say a kipsel or corn bin. She knew that if they came back to look for the child, they would search all her house, and so indeed they did. But not finding the child, after looking everywhere, they thought it best to go away, and declare to those by whom they had been sent that they had done their bidding. And thus they reported on their return home. Aetian's son grew up, and in remembrance of the danger from which he had escaped, was named Kipsilus, after the corn bin. When he reached to man's estate, he went to Delphi, and on consulting the oracle received a response which was two-sided. It was the following. See, there comes to my dwelling a man much favored of fortune, Kipsilus, son of Aetian, and king of the glorious Corinth, he and his children too, but not his children's children. Such was the oracle. And Kipsilus put so much faith in it that he forthwith made his attempt and thereby became master of Corinth. Having thus got the tyranny, he showed himself a harsh ruler. Many of the Corinthians he drove into banishment. Many he deprived of their fortunes and a still greater number of their lives. His reign lasted thirty years and was prosperous to its close, insomuch that he left the government to Periander, his son. This prince, at the beginning of his reign, was of a milder temper than his father, but after he corresponded by means of messengers with Thrasybulus, tyrant of Miletus, he became even more sanguinary. On one occasion he sent a herald to ask Thrasybulus what mode of government it was safest to set up in order to rule with honor. Thrasybulus led the messenger without the city and took him into a field of corn through which he began to walk while he asked him again and again concerning his coming from Corinth, ever as he went, breaking off and throwing away all such ears of corn as overtopped the rest. In this way he went through the whole field and destroyed all the best and richest part of the crop. Then, without a word, he sent the messenger back. On the return of the man to Corinth, Periander was eager to know what Thrasybulus had counseled, but the messenger reported that he had said nothing, and he wondered that Periander had sent him to so strange a man, who seemed to have lost his senses, since he did nothing but destroy his own property. And upon this he told how Thrasybulus had behaved at the interview. Periander, perceiving what the action meant, and knowing that Thrasybulus advised the destruction of all the leading citizens, treated his subjects from this time forward with the very greatest cruelty. Where Kipsilus had spared any, and had neither put them to death nor banished them, Periander completed what his father had left unfinished. One day he stripped all the women of Corinth stark naked for the sake of his own wife, Melissa. He had sent messengers into Thrasprotia to consult the oracle of the dead upon the Acheron concerning a pledge which had been given into his charge by a stranger, and Melissa appeared, but refused to speak or tell where the pledge was. 
She was chill, she said, having no clothes. The garments buried with her were of no manner of use, since they had not been burnt. And this should be her token to Periander that what she said was true. The oven was cold when he baked his loaves in it. When this message was brought him, Periander knew the token, for he had lain with Melissa's corpse. Wherefore he straightway made proclamation that all the wives of the Corinthians should go forth to the temple of Hera. So the women apparelled themselves in their bravest and went forth, as if to a festival. Then, with the help of his guards, whom he had placed for the purpose, he stripped them one and all, making no difference between the free women and the slaves, and taking their clothes to a pit, he called on the name of Melissa and burnt the whole heap. This done, he sent a second time to the oracle, and Melissa's ghost told him where he would find the stranger's pledge. Such, O oh Lacedaemonians, is tyranny and such are the deeds which spring from it. We Corinthians marveled greatly when we first knew of your having sent for Hippias, and now it surprises us still more to hear you speak as you do. We adjure you by the common gods of Greece, plant not despots in her cities. If, however, you are determined, if you persist against all justice in seeking to restore Hippias, know at least that the Corinthians will not approve your conduct. When Sosicles, the deputy from Corinth, had thus spoken, Hippias replied, and invoking the same gods, he said, Of a surety the Corinthians will, beyond all others, regret the Pisistratidae when the fated days come for them to be distressed by the Athenians. Hippias spoke thus because he knew the prophecies better than any man living. But the rest of the allies, who till Sosicles spoke, had remained quiet. When they heard him utter his thoughts thus boldly, all together broke silence and declared themselves of the same mind. And withal they conjured the Lacedaemonians not to revolutionize a Grecian city. And in this way the enterprise came to naught. Hippias hereupon withdrew. And Amintas, the Macedonian, offered him the city of Anthemus, while the Thessalians were willing to give him Iolcus, but he would accept neither the one nor the other, preferring to go back to Sigeum, which city Pisistratus had taken by force of arms from the Mytilineans. Pisistratus, when he became master of the place, established there as tyrant his own natural son, Hegesistratus, whose mother was an Argive woman. But this prince wasn't allowed to enjoy peaceably what his father had made over to him, for during very many years there had been war between the Athenians of Sigeum and the Mytileneans of the city called Achilleum. They of Mytilene insisted on having the place restored to them, but the Athenians refused, since they argued that the Aeolians had no better claim to the Trojan territory than themselves, or than any of the other Greeks who helped Menelaus on occasion of the rape of Helen. War accordingly continued, with many and various incidents, whereof the following was one. In a battle which was gained by the Athenians, the poet Alcaeus took to flight, and saved himself, but lost his arms, which fell into the hands of the conquerors. They hung them up in the temple of Athena at Sigeum, and Alcaeus made a poem, describing his misadventure to his friend Melanippus, and sent it to him at Mytilene. The Mytileneans and Athenians were reconciled by Periander, the son of Cypselus, who was chosen by both parties as arbiter. He decided that they should each retain that of which they were at the time possessed, and Sigeum passed in this way under the dominion of Athens. On the return of Hippias to Asia from Lacedaemon, he moved heaven and earth to set Artaphernes against the Athenians, and did all that lay in his power to bring Athens into subjection to himself and Darius. So when the Athenians learned what he was about, they sent envoys to Sardis and exhorted the Persians not to lend an ear to the Athenian exiles. Artaphernes told them in reply that if they wished to remain safe, they must receive back Hippias. 
The Athenians, when this answer was reported to them, determined not to consent, and therefore made up their minds to be at open enmity with the Persians. The Athenians had come to this decision and were already in bad odour with the Persians when Aristagoras, the Milesian, dismissed from Sparta by Cleomenes the Lacedaemonian, arrived at Athens. He knew that after Sparta, Athens was the most powerful of the Grecian states. Accordingly, he appeared before the people and, as he had done at Sparta, spoke to them of the good things which there were in Asia and of the Persian mode of fight, how they used neither shield nor spear and were very easy to conquer. All this he urged and reminded them also that Miletus was a colony from Athens and therefore ought to receive their succor since they were so powerful and in the earnestness of his entreaties he cared little what he promised till at the last he prevailed and won them over. It seems indeed to be easier to deceive a multitude than one man, for Aristagoras, though he failed to impose on Cleomenes the Lacedaemonian, succeeded with the Athenians, who were thirty thousand. Won by his persuasions, they voted that twenty ships should be sent to the aid of the Ionians, under the command of Melanthius, one of the citizens, a man of mark in every way. These ships were the beginning of mischief, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Aristagoras sailed away in advance, and when he reached Miletus devised a plan from which no manner of advantage could possibly accrue to the Ionians. Indeed, in forming it, he didn't aim at their benefit, but his sole wish was to annoy King Darius. He sent a messenger into Phrygia to those Paeonians who had been led away captive by Megabazus from the river Strymon, and who now dwelt by themselves in Phrygia, having a tract of land and a hamlet of their own. This man, when he reached the Paeonians, spoke thus to them. Men of Paeonia, Aristagoras, king of Miletus, has sent me to you to inform you that you may now escape if you choose to follow the advice he proffers. All Ionia has revolted from the king, and the way is open to you to return to your own land. You have only to contrive to reach the sea coast. The rest shall be our business. When the Paeonians heard this, they were exceedingly rejoiced and taking with them their wives and children, they made all speed to the coast, a few only remaining in Phrygia through fear. The rest, having reached the sea, crossed over to Chios, where they had just landed, when a great troop of Persian horse came following upon their heels and seeking to overtake them. Not succeeding, however, they sent a message across to Chios and begged the Paeonians to come back again. These last refused, and were conveyed by the Chians from Chios to Lesbos, and by the Lesbians thence to Doriscus, from which place they made their way on foot to Paeonia. The Athenians now arrived with a fleet of twenty sail, and brought also in their company five triremes of the Eritreans, which had joined the expedition not so much out of goodwill towards Athens as to pay a debt which they already owed to the people of Miletus. For in the old war between the Chalcidians and Eritreans, the Milesians fought on the Eritrean side throughout, while the Chalcidians had the help of the Samian people. Aristagoras, on their arrival, assembled the rest of his allies and proceeded to attack Sardis, not, however, leading the army in person, but appointing to the command his own brother, Carapinus, and Hermaphantus, one of the citizens, while he himself remained behind in Miletus. The Ionians sailed with this fleet to Ephesus, and leaving their ships at Caressus in the Ephesian territory, took guides from the city and went up the country with a great host. They marched along the course of the river Caesta, and crossing over the ridge of Timolus, came down upon Sardis and took it, no man opposing them. The whole city fell into their hands, except only the citadel, which Artaphernes defended in person, having with him no contemptible force. 
Though, however, they took the city, they didn't succeed in plundering it. For as the houses in Sardis were most of them built of reeds, and even the few which were of brick had a reed thatching for their roof, one of them was no sooner fired by a soldier than the flames ran speedily from house to house and spread over the whole place. As the fire raged, the Lydians and such Persians as were in the city, enclosed on every side by the flames which had seized all the skirts of the town, and finding themselves unable to get out, came in crowds into the marketplace and gathered themselves upon the banks of the Pactolus. This stream, which comes down from Mount Tmolus and brings the Sardians a quantity of gold dust, runs directly through the marketplace of Sardis and joins the Hermus before that river reaches the sea. So the Lydians and Persians, brought together in this way in the marketplace and about the Pactolus, were forced to stand on their defence. And the Ionians, when they saw the enemy in part resisting, in part pouring towards them in dense crowds, took fright, and drawing off to the ridge which is called Tmolus, when night came, went back to their ships. Sardis, however, was burnt, and, among other buildings, a temple of the native goddess Sibeli was destroyed, which was the reason afterwards alleged by the Persians for setting on fire the temples of the Greeks. As soon as what had happened was known, all the Persians who were stationed on this side, the Halis, drew together and brought help to the Lydians. Finding, however, when they arrived that the Ionians had already withdrawn from Sardis, they set off, and following close upon their track, came up with them at Ephesus. The Ionians drew out against them in battle array, and a fight ensued, wherein the Greeks had very greatly the worse. Vast numbers were slain by the Persians. Among other men of note they killed the captain of the Eritreans, a certain Eualchidas, a man who had gained crowns at the games and received much praise from Simonides the Chian. Such as made their escape from the battle dispersed among the several cities. So ended this encounter. Afterwards the Athenians quite forsook the Ionians, and though Aristagoras besought them much by his ambassadors, refused to give him any further help. Still the Ionians, notwithstanding this desertion, continued unceasingly their preparations to carry on the war against the Persian king, which their late conduct towards him had rendered unavoidable. Sailing into the Hellespont, they brought Byzantium and all the other cities in that quarter under their sway, and quitting the Hellespont, they went to Caria and won the greater part of the Carians to their side, while Cornus, which had formerly refused to join with them, after the burning of Sardis came over likewise. All the Cyprians too, excepting those of Amethus, of their own proper motion espoused the Ionian cause. The occasion of their revolting from the Medes was the following. There was a certain Onesilus, younger brother of Gorgas, king of Salamis, and son of Chersis, who was son of Siromus, and grandson of Evelthon. This man had often in former times entreated Gorgas to rebel against the king, but when he heard of the revolt of the Ionians, he left him no peace with his importunity. As, however, Gorgas wouldn't hearken to him, he watched his occasion, and when his son had gone outside the town, he, with his partisans, closed the gates upon him. Gorgas, thus deprived of his city, fled to the Medes, and Onesilus, being now king of Salamis, sought to bring about a revolt of the whole of Cyprus. All were prevailed on except the Amethusians, who refused to listen to him, whereupon Onesilus sat down before Amethus and laid siege to it. While Onesilus was engaged in the siege of Amethus, King Darius received tidings of the taking and burning of Sardis by the Athenians and Ionians, and at the same time he learned that the author of the league, the man by whom the whole matter had been planned and contrived, was Aristagoras the Milesian. It said that he no sooner understood what had happened than laying aside all thought concerning the Ionians, who would, he was sure, pay dear for their rebellion, he asked who the Athenians were, and being informed, called for his bow, and placing an arrow on the string, shot upward into the sky, saying as he let fly the shaft, Grant me Zeus to revenge myself on the Athenians. 
After this speech, he bade one of his servants every day, when his dinner was spread three times, repeat these words to him, Master, remember the Athenians. Then he summoned into his presence Histiaeus of Miletus, whom he had kept at his court for so long a time, and on his appearance addressed him thus, I am told, O Histiaeus, that thy lieutenant, to whom thou hast given Miletus in charge, has raised a rebellion against me. He has brought men from the other continent to contend with me, and prevailing on the Ionians, whose conduct I shall know how to recompense, to join with this force, he has robbed me of Sardis. Is this as it should be, thinkest thou, or can it have been done without thy knowledge and advice? Beware, lest it be found hereafter that the blame of these acts is thine. Histiaeus answered, What words are these, O king, to which thou hast given utterance? I advise aught from which unpleasantness of any kind, little or great, should come to thee. What could I gain by so doing, or what is there that I lack now? Have I not all that thou hast, and am I not thought worthy to partake all thy counsels? If my lieutenant has indeed done as thou sayest, be sure he has done it all of his own head. For my part I don't think it can really be that the Milesians and my lieutenant have raised a rebellion against thee, but if they have indeed committed aught to thy hurt, and the tidings are true which have come to thee, judge thou how ill-advised thou wert to remove me from the sea-coast. The Ionians, it seems, have waited till I was no longer in sight, and then sought to execute that which they long ago desired, whereas if I had been there not a single city would have stirred. Suffer me then to hasten at my best speed to Ionia, that I may place matters there upon their former footing, and deliver up to thee the deputy of Miletus who has caused all the troubles. Having managed to this business to thy heart's content, I swear by all the gods of thy royal house I will not put off the clothes in which I reach Ionia till I have made Sardinia, the biggest island in the world, thy tributary. Histiaeus spoke thus, wishing to deceive the king, and Darius, persuaded by his words, let him go, only bidding him be sure to do as he had promised, and afterwards come back to Susa. In the meantime, while the tidings of the burning of Sardis were reaching the king, and Darius was shooting the arrow and having the conference with Histiaeus, and the latter, by permission of Darius, was hastening down to the sea, in Cyprus the following events took place. Tidings came to Onesilus the Salaminian, who was still besieging Amethus, that a certain Artibius, a Persian, was looking for to arrive in Cyprus with a great Persian armament. So Onesilus, when the news reached him, sent off heralds to all parts of Ionia, and besought the Ionians to give him aid. After brief deliberation, these last in full force passed over into the island, and the Persians about the same time crossed in their ships from Cilicia, and proceeded by land to attack Salamis while the Phoenicians, with the fleet, sailed round the promontory which goes by the name of the Keys of Cyprus. In this posture of affairs, the princes of Cyprus called together the captains of the Ionians, and thus addressed them. Men of Ionia, we Cyprians leave it to you to choose whether you will fight with the Persians or with the Phoenicians. If it be your pleasure to try your strength on land against the Persians, come on shore at once, and array yourselves for the battle. We will then embark aboard your ships and engage the Phoenicians by sea. If, on the other hand, ye prefer to encounter the Phoenicians, let that be your task. Only be sure, whichever part you choose, to acquit yourself so that Ionia and Cyprus, so far as depends on you, may preserve their freedom. The Ionians made answer, The commonwealth of Ionia sent us here to guard the sea, not to make over our ships to you and engage with the Persians on shore. We will therefore keep the post which has been assigned to us, and seek therein to be of some service. To you, remembering what you suffered when you were the slaves of the Medes, behave like brave warriors. Such was the reply of the Ionians. 
Not long afterwards, the Persians advanced into the plain before Salamis, and the Cyprian kings ranged their troops in order of battle against them, placing them so that while the rest of the Cyprians were drawn up against the auxiliaries of the enemy, the choicest troops of the Salaminians and the Solians were set to oppose the Persians. At the same time, Onesilus, of his own accord, took post opposite to Artibius, the Persian general. Now Artibius rode a horse which had been trained to rear up against a foot soldier. Onesilus, informed of this, called to him his shield-bearer, who was a Carian by nation, a man well skilled in war and of daring courage, and thus addressed him. I hear, he said, that the horse which Artibius rides rears up and attacks with his forelegs and teeth the man against whom his rider urges him. Consider quickly, therefore, and tell me which wilt thou undertake to encounter, the steed or the rider? Then the squire answered him, Both, my liege, or either, am I ready to undertake, and there is nothing that I will shrink from at thy bidding. But I'll tell thee what seems to me to make most for thy interests. As thou art a prince and a general, I think thou shouldst engage with one who is himself both a prince and also a general. For then, if thou slayest thine adversary, it will redound to thine honour. And if he slays thee, which may heaven forfend, yet to fall by the hand of a worthy foe makes death lose half its horror. To us, thy followers, leave his war horse and his retinue. And have thou no fear of the horse's tricks. I warrant that this is the last time he will stand up against any one. Thus spake the Carian, and shortly after the two hosts joined battle both by sea and land. And here it chanced to that by sea the Ionians, who that day fought as they have never done either before or since, defeated the Phoenicians, the Samians especially distinguishing themselves. Meanwhile the combat had begun on land, and the two armies were engaged in a sharp struggle, when thus it fell out in the matter of the generals. Artibius, astride upon his horse, charged down upon Onesilus, who, as he had agreed with his shield-bearer, aimed his blow at the rider. The horse reared and placed his forefeet upon the shield of Onesilus, when the carrion cut at him with a reaping hook and severed the two legs from the body. The horse fell upon the spot, and Artibius, the Persian general, with him. In the thick of the fight, Stesanor, tyrant of Curium, who commanded no inconsiderable body of troops, went over with them to the enemy. On this desertion of the Curians, Argive colonists, if report says true, forthwith the war chariots of the Salaminians followed the example set them and went over likewise, whereupon victory declared in favour of the Persians and the army of the Cyprians being routed, vast numbers were slain, and among them Onesilus, the son of Cosis, who was the author of the revolt, and Aristocyprus, king of the Solians. This Aristocyprus was son of Philosyprus, whom Solon the Athenian, when he visited Cyprus, praised in his poems beyond all other sovereigns. The Amethusians, because Onesilus had laid siege to their town, cut the head off his corpse and took it with them to Amethus, where it was set up over the gates. Here it hung till it became hollow, whereupon a swarm of bees took possession of it and filled it with a honeycomb. On seeing this, the Amethusians consulted the oracle and were commanded to take down the head and bury it, and thenceforth to regard Onesilus as a hero and offer sacrifice to him year by year, so that it would go the better with them. To this day the Amethusians do as they were then bidden. As for the Ionians who had gained the sea fight, when they found that the affairs of Onesilus were utterly lost and ruined, and that siege was laid to all the cities of Cyprus excepting Salamis, which the inhabitants had surrendered to Gorgas, the former king, forthwith they left Cyprus and sailed away home. Of the cities which were besieged, solely held out the longest, the Persians took it by undermining the wall in the fifth month from the beginning of the siege. Thus, after enjoying a year of freedom, the Cyprians were enslaved for a second time. 
Meanwhile, Dorises, who was married to one of the daughters of Darius, together with Hemias, Otanes, and other Persian captains who were likewise married to daughters of the king, after pursuing the Ionians who had fought at Sardis, defeating them and driving them to their ships, divided their efforts against the different cities and proceeded in succession to take and sack each one of them. Dorises attacked the towns upon the Hellespont and took in as many days the five cities of Dardanus, Abydus, Bercoti, Lampsicus and Pisus. From Pisus he marched against Parium, but on his way receiving intelligence that the Carians had made common cause with the Ionians and thrown off the Persian yoke, he turned round and leaving the Hellespont marched away towards Caria. The Carians, by some chance, got information of this movement before Dorises arrived and drew together their strength to a place called the White Columns, which is on the river Arisias, a stream running from the Idrian country and emptying itself into the Mayanda. Here, when they were met, many plans were put forth, but the best, in my judgment, was that of Pixodarus, the son of Morsulus, a Kindian, who was married to a daughter of Cyanethis, the Cilician king. His advice was that the Carians should cross the Mayanda and fight with the river at their back, that so all chance of flight being cut off they might be forced to stand their ground and have their natural courage raised to a still higher pitch. His opinion, however, didn't prevail. It was thought best to make the enemy have the Mayanda behind them, that so if they were defeated in the battle and put to flight they might have no retreat open but be driven headlong into the river. The Persians soon afterwards approached, and crossing the Mayanda engaged the Carians upon the banks of the Odysseus, where for a long time the battle was starkly contested, but at last the Carians were defeated, being overpowered by numbers. On the side of the Persians there fell two thousand, while the Carians hadn't fewer than ten thousand slain. Such as escaped from the field of battle collected together at a Labranda in the vast precinct of Zeus Stratius, a deity worshipped only by the Carians, and in the sacred grove of plane trees. Here they deliberated as to the best means of saving themselves, doubting whether they would fare better if they gave themselves up to the Persians or if they abandoned Asia forever. As they were debating these matters, a body of Miletians and allies came to their assistance whereupon the Carians, dismissing their former thoughts, prepared themselves afresh for war, and on the approach of the Persians gave them battle a second time. They were defeated, however, with still greater loss than before, and while all the troops engaged suffered severely, the blow fell with most force on the Milesians. The Carians, some while after, repaired their ill fortune in another action. Understanding that the Persians were about to attack their cities, they laid an ambush for them on the road which leads to Pedassus. The Persians who were making a night march fell into the trap, and the whole army was destroyed, together with the generals Dorisis, Amorges, and Sisamachis. Merses too, the son of Gyges, was killed at the same time. The leader of the ambush was Heraclides, the son of Ibanolis, a man of Mylassa. Such was the way in which these Persians perished. The Carians, some while after, repaired their ill fortune in another action. Understanding that the Persians were about to attack their cities, they laid an ambush for them on the road which leads to Pedassus. The Persians who were making a night march fell into the trap, and the whole army was destroyed, together with the generals Dorisis, Amorges, and Sisamachis. Merses too, the son of Gyges, was killed at the same time. The leader of the ambush was Heraclides, the son of Ibanolis, a man of Mylassa. Such was the way in which these Persians perished. In the meantime, Himaeus, who was likewise one of those by whom the Ionians were pursued after their attack on Sardis, directing his course towards the Propontis, took Chios, a city of Mysia. Learning, however, that Dorises had left the Hellespont and was gone into Caria, he, in his turn, quitted the Propontis, and marching with the army under his command to the Hellespont, reduced all the Aeolians of the Troad, and likewise conquered the Gergithai a remnant of the ancient Teucrians. He didn't, however, quit the Troad, but after gaining these successes was himself carried off by disease. 
After his death, which happened as I have related, Artaphernes, the satrap of Sardis, and Otanes, the third general, were directed to undertake the conduct of the war against Ionia and the neighbouring Aeolis. By them, Cladzomene in the former and Chime in the latter were recovered. As the cities fell one after another, Aristagoras, the Milesian, who was in truth, as he now plainly showed, a man of but little courage, notwithstanding that it was he who had caused the disturbances in Ionia and made so great a commotion, began, seeing his danger, to look about for means of escape. Being convinced that it was in vain to endeavour to overcome King Darius, he called his brothers in arms together and laid before them the following project. "'Twould be well, he said, to have some place of refuge in case they were driven out of Miletus, should he go out at the head of a colony to Sardinia, or should he sail to Myrcinus in Edonia, which Histiaeus had received as a gift from King Darius and had begun to fortify. To this question of Aristagoras, Hecataeus the historian, son of Hegesander, made answer that in his judgment neither place was suitable. Aristagoras should build a fort, he said, in the island of Leros, and if driven from Miletus should go there and bide his time. From Leros, attacks might readily be made, and he might re-establish himself in Miletus. Such was the advice given by Hecataeus. Aristagoras, however, was bent on retiring to Myrcinus. Accordingly, he put the government of Miletus into the hands of one of the chief citizens, named Pythagoras, and taking with him all who liked to go, sailed to Thrace, and there made himself master of the place in question. From thence he proceeded to attack the Thracians, but here he was cut off with his whole army while besieging a city whose defenders were anxious to accept terms of surrender.